Welcome back to the playlist on amino acid catabolism. Before we really go into the aromatic, the other aromatic amino acids, what I want to do is think a little bit about phenylketonuria. So we said that in phenylketonuria, uh, the, the, the person has a deficiency of phenylalanine hydroxylase. So that is this enzyme right there. So they have a deficiency of phenylalanine hydroxylase. And so most likely what happened is somewhere along the line, they had a mutation in the gene that codes for phenylalanine hydroxylase. And so it, it was enough of a mutation that affected the three-dimensional structure of phenylalanine hydroxylase, and it, and it basically made it non-functional. And in the previous video, we, we briefly looked at it, and it, we actually looked at an example with um, this molecule right here is aspartame right and aspartame contains phenylalanine and you can see the phenylalanine residue right here right there's at least the the r group of phenylalanine right along with the alpha carbon and if you were to look at the complete hydrolysis of aspartame you would get one aspartate residue one phenylalanine and a methanol which we don't really care about but the, but the thing is is if you were to consume a lot of aspartame per every aspartame molecule that you consume you get one phenylalanine right theoretically and so that's why they have to have those labels on foods that says contains phenylalanine at least to a large extent because of people with phenylketonuria they can't they can't convert phenylalanine to tyrosine, and therefore, in the catabolic pathway, they can't complete it. So if they consume phenylalanine, it just builds up um, for the most part. But it turns out that there are some metabolic pathways that can consume phenylalanine. It's just not this pathway, and then they're really slow. Okay, And, one of the, and what we're going to talk about in this video is one of the ways that doctors can actually test for phenylketonuria. There are several molecules here that I've drawn in white, and these are products that might appear in the urine, and we'll talk about those sequentially. Okay? So phenylalanine, although it can't react with phenylalanine hydroxylase because that's mutated and it's dysfunctional, it can react with a certain amino transferase or a transaminase, and specifically it's a type of alanine amino transferase. So notice here what I have drawn. This molecule is what? This Let me do it in white. Where's my mouse? Sorry. Um, this molecule right here, this is pyruvate, right? This is pyruvate. And this molecule is alanine, right? So this is a type of alanine aminotransferase. And in the direction that it's running here, it's taking phenylalanine and it's converting it reversibly to this molecule right here. And this is called phenyl. This is called phenylpyruvate. And phenylpyruvate is actually the primary uh, molecule that you actually see in the urine uh, with, in a person with phenylketonuria. So this is actually one of the molecules that they test for when they're testing to see if someone has phenylketonuria. And this is just a simple aminotransferase reaction. So if you notice here on uh, phenylalanine, notice we have that alpha amine. And so that alpha amine ultimately ends up on as the alpha amine on alanine and just like pyruvate has a, a carbonyl so too does uh, phenylpyruvate okay so basically the amine was substituted with the carbonyl on phenylpyruvate and remember it pains me to say this because it's not technically the mechanism but with amino transferases you can sort of view them as substitutions between an amine and a carbonyl and vice versa now what I want to think about is you know this reaction of this transaminase is technically a reversible enzyme right it's reversible and again it, re it requires a cofactor and that's pyridoxal phosphate right it's technically a reversible enzyme but it really is only going to run in the direction that I've shown and let's think about why that might be well if you have somebody that has phenylketonuria and they have a lot of phenylalanine that's building up by Le Chatelier's principle it's going to force this reaction to go towards phenylpyruvate and one thing that I haven't mentioned at this point that you should probably be aware of is the delta G standard of the delta G of of amino transferases is approximately zero. 
it's one of the few reactions in which the delta G is approximately zero. So it's pretty easy to go in either direction, okay? So basically, if you load this reaction up with phenylalanine, you're gonna force this reaction to go towards phenylpyruvate. Okay, so in other words, um, the only, if phenylalanine hydroxylase is defective, the only possible way that phenylalanine can get, you can get rid of it is by converting it to phenylpyruvate, and that's of course going to be seen in the urine, and they can actually test that. Okay, but there's actually two other fates of, of phenylpyruvate. There's two other fates of it, sorry. And one of them is reacting with the enzyme that's shown as B, and that's called phenylpyruvate reductase. Okay? This is an NADPH-dependent enzyme, and it's essentially going to take that carbonyl that's right here, and it's going to totally reduce it down to an alcohol. And again, this is called phenylpyruvate reductase. And although this molecule, by the way, this is called phenyl, this is called phenylactate, this is phenyl lactate, and you can see the lactic, the lactate group, right? The lactate groups right here. If you remember the structure of lactate, lactate looks like this. All right here's lactate. Remember we saw that when we did lactate dehydrogenase, and that's the lactate group, and you can certainly see the phenyl group. But phenyl lactate you also see in the urine, okay? Although it's not as common as phenylpyruvate, but you can also see that in the urine as well. Now, phenylpyruvate can also react with a third enzyme that's labeled as C, and that enzyme is called phenyl phenylpyruvate decarboxylase. So phenylpyruvate decarboxylase, and the product that you get is called phenyl, is called phenyl acetate, okay? And you can certainly see the acetate group that's right here. Here's the acetate group. That's your acetate. And so when you use phenylpyruvate decarboxylase, you get phenyl acetate. And this is also a product that you can see in the urine. So when the doctors, one of the things they do is when they're testing for someone to see if they have phenylketonuria, they're testing for these three products you see in the urine. And part of the reason that you see this is just Le Chatelier's principle at work. If phenylalanine hydroxylase is not consuming phenylalanine, it has to go somewhere, right? So one of the enzymes that's going to consume it is that transaminase, that type of alanine aminotransferase that basically is only going to run in that direction in someone with phenylketonuria, right? If you if you can't go in the phenyl phenylalanine hydroxylase direction, it's going to, going to go the other direction. But remember that aminotransferases have a delta G very close to zero. So it can really go in either direction. It's just going to depend on is phenylalanine in higher concentration or is phenylpyruvate. And phenylalanine is probably going to be in higher concentration. So by Le Chatelier's principle, it's going to force the reaction to go towards phenylpyruvate. And that's the reason I've drawn it as a one-way arrow because on under this homeostatic imbalanced uh, condition, it's only going to go in that direction. And then it can either be reduced by NADPH by phenylpyruvate, uh, phenylpyruvate reductase, or it's going to go, uh, it's going to be decarboxylated by phenylpyruvate decarboxylase. And you'll get phenylactate and phenylacetate respectively. So I hope this video gave a little bit of intuition on what actually happens to phenylalanine once you lose the ability to use phenylalanine hydroxylase. See you in the next video.